life is a game, it's a puzzle, and it is meaningless. And thus we bring the meaning of, of love and enjoyment and celebration to that game. For me, achieving this much just shows me that you can dream, and if you dream big enough and hard enough and work at it, you can achieve it. So the question just is, what do, I, what do we want to dream next? Not, you know, oh darn, that's over. It's like, oh cool, so, you know, Dome Fest 2032 inside the moon? I don't know, like. So here we are, we got Ben from Pigeons Playing Ping Pong. This is a special episode recorded on bicycle day so here we are all right happy bicycle day so ben how are you good sir you you getting excited for dome fest i am very excited yeah it's uh it's always a oddly enough a culmination of the summer at the beginning so that the rest of it's just enjoyment and like celebration all the hard work that jeremy and greg and everyone else put into it really pays off throughout the rest of the summer and then it feels like a festive joyous celebration which is what festivals are to me what would you say is the original reason you love music so much that you decide to devote your life to it? I guess probably the communication that it speaks to me, speaks through me, and speaks for me. Um, and I found that communication is a bedrock of love. And um, I love music. Do you ever think about, like, as someone, your, your career is in music? What, what the original purpose music served was when we were like early humans. Oh yeah. Um, same thing. It serves for animals these days. Birds uh, make music to communicate displeasure or, you know, in the form of their metal music or love, love songs. Um, whales use music uh, again for communication purposes. Um, I think back in the day, in addition to just the joyous celebration and rhythmic patterns that are uh, sort of inherent on a fractal level and all of all of reality um expressing that in a form that you know speaks to our souls it just shows that life is more about is more than just about living it's about uh, thriving and enjoying and i think that music is an early uh, progenitor of that concept in our species so do you feel like music predates humans as as a thing beyond just communication because music yeah. is kind of a step further than communication can I ask you a question? Yeah. If a tree falls in the forest and no one's around to hear it, is it musical? Mm. So not to be coy or, or whatever, but um, the question itself, I guess, doesn't leave room for an answer for me. Um, which came first, the, hum the music or the human to hear music? Um, there's sound waves, so I guess it's not music unless humans are hearing it, but I do think of music as something much deeper and more uh, primal and, and root than, uh, than others might give it credit for. I know you're a pretty deep guy when it comes to science and definitely like quasi new age science, whatever, whatever quasi new age as a label means to you. But um, I want to ask you, like with sound itself and music and the psychology of the listener, do you ever think about how it can be such a like powerfully healing thing to to an organism? Yeah, I, I do. Um, I want to respond first to the, the quasi new age. Um, my new age-ness is uh, rooted in the Tao of Physics by Fritjof Capra. And anyone who hasn't read it, I think it's 1976, I would recommend checking it out. Um, that bridged the empirical science-based mind that I'd have up to that point. And when I discovered um, the glories of quantum mechanics and um, Einstein's being wrong about God not playing dice, the Tao of physics kind of brought me into um, a more Eastern leaning aspect. Uh, that was, I guess, I was already on the way. But going to your question, I think that we still have things to, to learn about what makes up reality as we, we always do. You know, each generation of science um, figures out why the other one was wrong and why they're right. And then the next one does the same thing. Um, and I think a few uh, paradigm shifts away we'll be able to understand more about why music is such a healing aspect to the deep emotional and spiritual physical self so just just shooting from the hip here i mean <laughs> obviously neither of us are scientists what's your perspective on on what's going on when you're playing music and somebody is having this bliss 
crying, like euphoric healing experience. What do you think happened between you as the musician, the music and themselves that, that led to that? Alignment. So then that begs the question, how, how does music create alignment? It um, vibrates us all at the same level. And so when we're vibrating at the same level and the same experience, you know, we become more as one, literally, and you mm. become aligned with the other and within yourself. Um, and I, you know, I know about Kundalini awakenings can have the same type of reactions where you're blissful, crying, you know, freaking out. Um, so from what you're describing, it sounds a similar type of alignment occurring that's releasing all this energy that's either been built up inside or been blocked for whatever reason. Talking a little bit more specifically about trance, trance music and, and rhythm, repeating rhythms, almost similar to a mantra. What do you think specifically that brings to the musical experience? How, what effect does, does that specifically have in your mind? Um, it deepens the pocket. It's like putting a groove in something and you just keep grooving on it and you, you open up the space in which that can sit. That makes sense? <laughs> And I'd be remiss not to wrap this part of the conversation without hearing your take on bass frequencies. I found that I, I'm one of the type of people who likes living in an ocean of bass at a show. It feels like it permeates everything. And I could do a whole show, I think, where I'm just sitting in a ocean of that bass. Um, what we do, you know, depending on the venue and, and the vibes and everything like that, you can find a spot where you can hit that pocket or you know, regularly or occasionally when I drop into that, you know, sub octave pedal. It's, to me, it's, it's a, it fills the space out and brings things together. I once described the goal of, of Pigeon's music as being an ocean of bass with a foundation of a shaking house, just like in an earthquake, <clears throat> doom, with uh, the guitars being like lasers shooting through the windows. And then like waves, you know, I guess Greg's guitar, <laughs> you know, waves mm. never crashing through. Um, but yeah, I, I like that. Some people would rather be open and clean and hear the guitars and things like that. Um, and that's what the beauty of everyone's different um, perspectives and uh, what makes a great, uh, a great musical experience, both by fans and band, is the expectations each individual has to, and then how they compromise to work to fit the bigger picture. I've looked at music as a potter's wheel where you got to throw the music in and then use your brain, body, whatever unit to carve into it and create, it's already a moving circle and you're just kind of coming in and making these little incisions that as you do your thing, it creates something much more beautiful and complete and natural than if you were just building it up piece by piece. So that's the way I approach music is let it run, let it spin and kind of dig in where you need to and let it be its own thing that you're just kind of helping to shape using the energy of the spinning. How do psychedelics lead to a different or enhanced experience as, as the musician and then also as the listener? Well, any psychedelic experience, which doesn't necessarily need to be a substance. Um, you know, I've had some of my most psychedelic experiences on a long bike ride around Lake Tahoe, uh, for example. But um, the experience of breaking down your paradigm, like we're talking about science, I've, I learned in philosophy of science, philosophy 250, one of the few classes in college I went to and enjoyed and attended and um, would have stayed if mo most of the classes were like that. Um, talks about paradigm shifts and how science will build up a paradigm of how it views things and then it will test it, test it, test it and break it down and then build a new one. And I thought, well, that's great for so society. Why can't it work for me? So why don't I build paradigms, know that I'm building a paradigm and shatter it every chance I get until I find a better one to replace it. Um, and psychedelics, I think, taught me to do that and accomplish that same um, objective in the individual that uh, science, that the scientific method accomplishes societally. Maybe. Can you elaborate on the value of kind of breaking down paradigms in general? Yeah. If you take a, a sheet of ice and drop it, it's going to smash. If you take a cup of water, you know, it's not going to break apart. You know, you could pour it out and bring it between different containers. Um, you don't want to crystallize, you don't want to harden, because then you're just, you're able to be broken. If you stay, remain flexible and open to things, then you can fit whatever container you're put in. Ben, this is a question I, I am very curious of your answer. 
you and I, we, we live in this world where we're surrounded by lots of uh, very creative um, hippie kind of people who, who are willing to think in abstract ways while also we come from backgrounds where, where we're taught to think a really certain way by, by the school systems and, and a Western kind of this is the way things are. And in talking about psychedelics a bit, do you feel like profound psychedelic experiences and what one can observe on those experiences, what you've observed in, in those experiences, do you think they have deeper implications about who we really are and, and what life really is? And like, what, what would you take a stab at saying those implications are? I think this gets to the, the my fractalized view in the sense that even at those higher levels, quote unquote, of revelation, um, what remains is that there is no inherent in the universe or in existence. Um, it is an infinite kaleidoscope of timelessness that churns a, a formulation of love and darkness back and forth that we experience in a linear progression. And uh, I suppose when you are experiencing those things, um, you might be getting some different perspective outside of our temporal experience of what that might entail. But the only way to truly understand the entirety of existence is to be the entirety of existence, which in my view, by God exploding himself into a billion different conscious units that we call life, he is, we are not able to do it until we once again unify and then we can understand ourselves. So. No, they don't have any higher significance is my answer. Being constantly on the road for however many eons you have been, what do you think's allowed for you to all have this positive morale that's led to the longevity and success you've had? Shared purpose. Um, we, we care about the music. We care about cultivating the flock and bringing people joy and, and community and togetherness. And that matters so much more than any individual argument or complication or issue. Um, and that takes privacy is our love for what we do and why we do it. When life on the road can get incredibly like, let's just say gray, what have you learned about getting yourself out of that kind of rut? Two things. One, you don't have a choice. Um, you can stay in the rut, but you have to do the work. Uh, and two, you can make good decisions even if they don't seem like an option. Um, or if it doesn't seem worth it. And sometimes it just takes, that's the other thing, it just takes time. Um, this too shall pass, no matter if we're playing Red Rocks or if I can't get out of bed in the morning. It's not going to be forever. Um, and that's what I remember. Would you say you get nervous before playing huge shows? I read an, in a Malcolm Gladwell book that for professional skydivers, when they're getting ready for a, a, a jump, you know, they pack their shoot, shoot the night before they're getting all ready and the, they've been measured that their peak of nervousness is the night before. Whereas amateurs are going for the first time, theirs goes up and up and up and up until they jump because the professionals know that the nervousness is best applied the night before when you're packing your shoots. Like, well, let me make double sure this is all good. Uh, and then by the time it comes to jump, you can't be nervous. So as a professional who's been doing it for years, I don't get as nervous when I get on stage, but I do think about how I messed up after and practice like before, like, oh shit, I might mess this up. But once we get up there, it's not, it doesn't serve. There are moments where it's like, this is a, by far the biggest show we've done. And it's, you, you know those, you remember those. Um, but I try not to get nervous. And if I do, I don't, I try not to buy into it at least or give it energy. Nervousness is a useful um, emotion when applied appropriately, as most are. Most are, you know, emotions are just tools. You can use a hammer to build a house or smash someone's head in, or write Maxwell Silver Hammer, which is a cool song. It's a very, very important skill to be able to calm overwhelm. Any advice about, about overwhelm and nervousness? And it may be talking to someone who has a a mind that's still in its adolescence kind of about calming overwhelm it's very very simple just learn how to breathe There's plenty of youtube videos and try <laughs> but if you take every breath and breathe consciously and think about it the more you do consciously the better you're gonna feel
I'd love to hear your take on darkness in art and how you think that could ultimately be a beautiful thing. Well, yeah, I mean, the best poetry I've written, the most authentic that I identify with as beyond me that I, I was able to tap into and truly be revelatory in its own way was written in some of the darkest time of my life. So darkness can be a great benefit for silencing the ego, mm. which is very important in art. That's an interesting answer. It's uh, from life experience, both ancient and recent. So is that, is that kind of the experience you would feel at maybe like a, like a Chan or an Umphrey's show, just a really heavy, like, is, or is your ego being silenced by the darkness? Um, with a Chan or Umphrey's type of, of darkness, like heaviness type of music, I didn't figure that out until I was a little older and I was at an Umphrey's show. That I understood as creating an us versus them where the crowd and the band was the us and the weird feeling you get from the music is them. And that's like the beast that you're vanquishing because you eventually come together and, you know, music works itself out and you, you land where you're supposed to. But in the meantime, you're creating this weird, like, mm -hmm, like, I don't feel good. And then, okay, we all feel good together. Like, look, we, we bonded as a team. That's what I see that as. That as. Fuck. Yeah. Does it motivate you at all? The, the sheer um how do i say horribleness that can exist that does exist from different different places in the world different people how do, yeah. how do you wrap your head around that like how do you help someone wrap their head around that well you just tell them to practice like um our friend uh, bill Purcell said you know just focus on your your love ripples outwards we can only have spheres of influence starting from inside working to your friends and family, working to your coworkers and, and outward. And if you can express love and help it ripple outward, and I'm talking real love, not Will Smith love, real, honest, honest to goodness love that doesn't have ego or violence or other agendas attached, soft heart and um, good attitude. That's what's going to change the world. That's the Tikkun Olam that I focus on personally. And music is kind of this thing that is, is a bit of a centerpiece with all of us in our own lives, you know, moving, moving that energy forward. You know, we're talking about the flock and how there's this powerfully moving healing experience happening in the crowd at pigeon shows. And there you are in, on the stage in the center of that. Can you describe just what that feels like to, to be the one on stage and, any kind of meaningfulness that has with you? Yeah, I mean, it's an honor. It's a privilege. Uh, it's a joy. Um, it's the best drug there is. There aren't too many words. Um, if you are really interested in to know what that's like, then I'd recommend fig figuring out how to do that in, with your life somehow. Um, and if you can't with music, can't play music, then there's other ways to... to to bring that energy or, or to find the connection and to, to be the conduit, I suppose. Um, so that's what it feels like. It feels like being a conduit of a, of a deeper experience. And a follow-up question to that, having you know, worked so hard to, to get to the level you're at, playing now huge shows you know, alongside legends on the same stage as people I'm sure one day you looked up to, oh, yeah. Red Rocks, Capitol Theater, all of this, yeah. screaming fans taking their shirts off. Has, <laughs> You only took it about that one time, Cam. Let's be honest. <laughs> Can you tell me what the thrill subsiding from these huge achievements, like dream level accomplishments and the expectations we put ourselves and the ultimate satisfaction from reaching our goals and then the, okay, well, what's next? What else? And kind of coming home after the thrill subsides and what that really teaches you about achievement, about what really matters. Can you... Can you share with me at all how your perspective of that has evolved throughout your success? For me, achieving this much just shows me that you can dream. And if you dream big enough and hard enough and work at it, you can achieve it. So it's, the question just is, what do, I, what do we want to dream next? Not, you know, oh, darn, that's over. It's like, oh, cool. So, you know, Dome Fest 2032 inside the moon. I don't know. Like, whatever, like we can, achievable goals are helpful. Um, in terms of achieving goals, but um, I would say 
this didn't look like an achievable goal to most from where I was sitting 10, 15 years ago. It shows you what you're really doing it for, and it's the love of the game and making the music. This past two years since the pandemic have been the most creative outpouring of our lives, I think, and I think it's going to continue, and it feels good to just be writing music. A new song, Overtime, we debuted at, a, at the Brooklyn Steel, the album release show. That was a song we wrote almost like that live one time with very similar lyrics. I have the original recording and it came out almost complete. We tightened up a lot of different parts and arranged it, but it was a song that we just like found in practice one day. And that is awesome. And working hard on Elefante or Surreal and then checking the you know views, like, okay, a few people have seen it, you know, a thousand, a couple thousand, that's great. You know, that's awesome. But the next thing I'm hungry for the next thing. I just want to create more like that's that's already done. That's for other people to to worry about now. Like have fun with the album. I worked hard and I've been listening to it for two years, almost, you know, year and a half. We've had a lot of these tracks, um, at least on some level. So I'm ready for it to go out in the world and, and work on the next thing. That's what drives me. Love of the game. Can Can you describe what that phrase means to you? Well, it's got two of the most important aspects of my life philosophy, love and game. Um, life is a game. It's a puzzle. You know, we on some level start at the end of the maze and work our way backwards, back to the end. Loving the game puts everything in perspective, bringing it back to the album name. Um, it is a game and it is meaningless. And thus we bring the meaning of, of love and enjoyment and celebration to that game. And that's what it means. Starting to wrap up here. I love it. Thank you, Ben, so thank much. You. And thank you for, for pursuing your your vision and your dream with this podcast. I can't believe I just started listening to it today when preparing for this, and I'm going to dig in a lot more. It's, I'm mm -hmm. looking for a good podcast. And um, after listening to Bill Frisell and then putting on the song you mentioned right after while I was making my sandwich, I was just like, today is a good day. Thank you, Ken. Wow. Man, that means a lot, Ben. That means a lot. Thank you very much. Can you talk to me about how things other than music inspire you as an artist, whether it's nature, your family, sports, books, the Ravens, whatever it might be, and how these things inspire you is, is really my question. Books. Um, I've always been an avid reader of books. They do the, the decalcification we were talking about. They clear my paradigms and my, my views and give me a different perspective and allow me to remain open and flexible and inviting whatever the world has to offer. This, this clearing the paradigms thing. I just got to say for a second, like my whole life, I've been super stubborn. Like, I, were you stubborn growing up? Like, Still am. This, this, this clearing the paradigms thing is pretty inverse. To, it, you're, you're almost being stubborn about clearing paradigms, but that mm -hmm. flies in the face of stubbornness. Like, it, you, you're, I think you're kind of underselling the, the perceived difficulty of this. I don't think I'm selling anything at all. I think <laughs> there and it's uh, it's uh, one of the um, what do they call them at festivals? Leave one, take one. You know, like the gift. Mm. That's what I'm doing. I'm dropping it out there. It might be junk. It might be gold and stuff. <laughs> but like, as someone who who relinqu who breaks down your own paradigms, do you do you at all wrestle with your stubbornness? Mm -hmm. And I didn't say I break them down. I say I attempt to. That's the goal. Attempt I to. I, I I hope to. I don't know if I do. I mean. I'm in therapy every week to try to do that better, you know? Mm. Um, yeah, that's the goal. But as we know with uh, asymptotes, they are unapproachable by nature. You're not going to get there, but it gives you a directionality. But don't take it too seriously. So this, this is a great segue into my next question. What does growth and improvement look like for you these days as an artist? It's very subjective, but I would have to just go the simpler route and just say fulfillment, whatever makes me feel more fulfilled and good. Um, I, I've been working a lot recently even in the past week, but it hasn't felt like work because I've been doing stuff I really like to do. I've just got this uh, RC505 MK2. It's a Mark Rebele looper, five channel looper here. Um, and I've been playing around with that and I got a new um, base case that'll make traveling um, on flights to the summer for festivals easier, as well as a new backpack. 
you know, I have a slightly cleaner space than I used to regularly. It's still not where I want it right now, but my baseline <laughs> uh, level of, of organization is, is improving. Um, yeah. I've left myself a lot of room for improvement in life. Um, and, you know, just tidying up. Wrapping up here, any direct message you'd like to leave any of your fans, any of the flock here off with from you to them? Check out Perspective if you haven't already. Go to Domefest um, and check out my website. Your website. Let's hear it. Lowendzen.com. Lowendzen. You got blog articles. You got poems. You got streams. What's going on? Um, it's just a landing space for all things Ben. Um, there's my poetry, right tab. We got a gear video that just dropped from um, Digital Tour Bus. So it's, if you want to check out my rig, that's right on the main page. The bottom of that page under some pictures is my two, I think the only two real looping solo sets I've done, which were both on a single looper. Um, so my next ones will be on this five looper. And then I have a low end Zen with Ben, little, I call them long form Instagram stories. Um, so it's just stupid little shit, but like 20 minutes of it instead of like 10 seconds. Um, and then there's a touching base, which is some stuff, you know, I play around with every Tuesday. I released one today on my Instagram, first period name, period bassist. Um, and there's, what else is there? Hey, you can go check it out yourself. Um, there's one other thing, but I, I, I add it, I play around with it. It's sort of its own little artistic canvas in of itself. So I don't say when I update it, it'll just kind of be different every now and then. Hell yeah. We'll have a low end Zen, all that linked in the description. But okay. the most important thing, what we're really here for is to gain some perspective, get yourself some perspective, pigeons playing ping pong.com and uh, albums out. We worked really hard on it. Um, you know, we didn't talk too much about it in this interview, um, but my general approach to music, um, I feel is, is, expressed well through through my my baselines on the album and in addition most more importantly than that our our group ability to communicate and work as a team we've been communicating really well and uh i think that shows in this album for sure ben from pigeons perspective album of course we're gonna have that link check it out dome fest at legend valley may 19th to the 21st all the cool kids will be there can i play us out play us out He's playing us out. got this far thank you for tuning in big shout out to our sponsor j and j distribution ohio's premier cbd and delta a wholesale supplier check out their brands death by gummies treetop gummies compassionate buds and kush burst gummies also big shout out to our sponsor sem tickets if you're looking for reasonably priced reliable ticketing source for your events Check them out. Got SEM tickets link in our bio. Got J and J distributions link in our bio. Retailers, check out J and J distribution. And yeah, much love, y'all. Mm.